Okay, so this begins chapter 17. This starts on page 328 in your book. This is going to be on the effects of systemic disease on nutritional status and oral health. This chapter is going to move a little bit faster than maybe feels comfortable because it is a review of your special needs. Um, it just sort of ties in nutrition into some of those components you've been learning about. Um, and also it's kind of the preview for oral pathology, which you'll get into next term. Okay, so this chapter two, it mostly just talks about um, different systemic diseases and how those affect someone's ability to eat food um, and how we might see either the systemic effect on the oral cavity or we might see those nutritional deficiencies on the oral cavity um, and and kind of how systemic disease relates to like everything you've been learning about in special needs how that systemic disease relates to oral care um, how nutrition plays a role in all of that um, the first step is going to be anorexia an appetite so anorexia isn't necessarily just someone who doesn't eat at all right anorexia is a term for a condition in which a person has a poor appetite uh, sorry appetite uh, and it can be for any reason um, you know it might be because they don't want to gain weight but it also just for you know maybe they're going through an illness or they are going through cancer treatments or they're in chronic pain or things like that for whatever reason they just don't care to eat um, malnutrition or other stresses such as infection surgeries or injuries resulting in anorexia will deplete the body stores of calories macronutrients and micronutrients um, those are the things that they need in order to regenerate and repair cells in order to sustain that immune system and so often what we see is someone who is going through anorexia for whatever reason they are at a, a more susceptible or more susceptibility to bacterial or viral infections all right and sometimes a uh, taste or a smell disorder can impact someone's uh, appetite and we, we all know that smell plays uh, the greatest role in our ability to taste um, and so for someone who has whatever condition if it somehow damaged their sense of smell uh, and has either uh, you know given them uh, you know dysnosmia or anosmia um, then they're going to be probably less interested in eating food uh, with that loss of taste as well patients uh, may require greater amounts of sodium and sugar so you know as people age and they aren't able to taste their foods quite as well maybe they have a condition or they're taking a medication that reduces their ability to smell or to taste they will try to compensate for that by making their food with more flavor um, and then sometimes too with certain medications we'll see a lot with uh, the medication chlorhexidine it's a rinse but uh, it will produce uh, dyskesia where it ha gives you kind of a it alters the way you taste things and sometimes it can leave you with a metallic taste in your mouth uh, even after it's gone even after you know there's nothing else there well you can swish with water but you can't get rid of that metallic taste um, certain foods or medications or uh, things like that will create that phantom taste uh, another factor is going to be uh, xerostomia um, so you know you guys already know that there are tons of medications uh, I'm sure you've looked them up and almost every medication you look up causes xerostomia um, so tons of medications will cause this but also certain conditions like Sjogren's disease is going to cause xerostomia and to some effect even just aging as, as people get older they could potentially produce less saliva um, and so the amount of xerostomia that you have will affect your ability to taste food um, you know when you chew up a food your saliva hits it it will uh, uh, evaporates to a certain extent and it creates kind of the aerosol that allows or it, you know the moisture picks up the particle which allows you to smell um, and so that's going to help you smell the food you're tasting so that you can taste it better um, but if you have serostomia you can't 
Um, and so this is on page 331. Uh, xerostomia reduces your nutritional status by making chewing difficult because you need a bolus to form when you chew up your food. And if you don't have enough moisture, you can't do that. Chewing is going to be painful because the mouth is sore, right? If all of your tissue is dry, it gets sore. Swallowing is difficult because the loss of lubrication from saliva, right? Things get kind of stuck in the throat a little bit uh, more often. Um, food intake may decrease because of changes in our taste perception. So we talked about that. The, there's no moisture kind of uh, creating that, that sense of smell as well. Um, and then food intake. Oh, I already did that one. Okay, moving on. All right, so there is two types of anemia that you need to be aware of for the purpose of taking your board exams and for passing my class, um, and they are coming up. So anemia itself, the symptoms of anemia, are going to be pallor of skin, which if you look on page 331 at that figure at the top, um, that is about as pale as it gets. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen someone that pale before. Um, that's, that's a new one for me. Um, overall weakness as a result of inadequate oxygen carrying power to the blood. Um, basically, you know, they're, they're just tired all the time. Um, the occurrence and severity of clinical symptoms depends on the degree of anemia and the speed of onset. So, you know, if it kind of develops over time and you're kind of used to being tired all the time or, uh, you know, if, if it, is something that's kind of chronic for you, or maybe it's just a mild anemia, then you're going to have less symptoms. But if it's if it's sudden or you know if it's severe, then you're going to have you're you're going to be like this guy at the figure 17.1 here. Okay, so the first one, the first uh, anemia is going to be iron deficiency anemia, which is the one uh, most people think about. Um, the etiology is going to uh, increase needs during growth periods, such as infancy or pregnancy. So if, you know, the woman is, um, anybody is growing, but also if a woman is having a child, um, they, they need more iron. And so they might become anemic because they're giving away essentially all of their iron or they're using all of it up. Um, excessive bleeding. So uh, some women deal with this through like, um, uh, like a monthly cycle. If they bleed a lot, then they typically bleed all, all of their iron and they need to eat more. Um, and then inadequate intake. So if there's someone who doesn't eat the right kinds of foods in order to absorb it, or if you, you know, uh, consume iron with uh, certain other foods, then it's going to block absorption, right? Um, oral manifestations of iron deficiency anemia is going to be atrophic glossitis. Um, so you can see an image of this figure 17.2. This is on page 331. Um, you can see that tongue is, is really shiny. We've lost all of the papilla on that tongue. Um, that is the atrophic glossitis or atrophy of the, uh, the papilla. Um, aphthous ulcers are a side effect of iron deficiency anemia just because there's you know, a, a lot more uh, inflammation there. Gingival and mucosal pallor, which we see on uh, figure 17.1. Um, angular chelosis, uh, which if you turn the page to um, 17.3, that individual, no, that's a different type of anemia, but that individual does have angular chelosis. Uh, candidiasis, which is uh, the influx of yeast and uh, is also called thrush, and then it may impair wound healing. Uh, dental hygiene considerations for this iron deficiency anemia is that we may need to postpone invasive non-surgical therapy until iron deficiency anemia improves. So if someone's very severe, if they show up as pale as the person in 17.1, um, then you might need to postpone treatment until they come back um, a normal color. Um, encourage iron rich foods. Uh, the example here is meat. Um, so red meat is the uh, highest in iron. Um, if they are a vegetarian or vegan, you're going to have to figure out a supplement of some kind or, or a different type of food. Um, encourage vitamin C in order to enhance absorption, right? So vit our iron will not be absorbed in the presence of calcium and vitamin D, right? Calcium and vitamin D go hand in hand. But iron and vitamin C come together. So, you know, if you're having an orange with your steak, then you're going to absorb more of the iron than you would if you ate the steak by itself. 
Um, if iron supplement is liquid, you should dilute it with water or juice and drink it with a straw to minimize tooth staining. So iron, which of course we know is a uh, ferrous, um, is, is it can cause stain of your teeth. All right, the other type of anemia that you need to know uh, for boards and for probably for all of your classes from here on out is going to be megaloblastic anemia. It's also called pernicious anemia. These two words are interchangeable. So this image right here is a woman who has, you can either call it megaloblastic anemia or you can say pernicious anemia. Most people say pernicious anemia. Um, so the etiology is um, an increased need an inadequate intake, right? So maybe the person is using more of their vitamin B12 for energy use. So they, they you know, need more vitamin B12. That's how they become deficient. Uh, they might have an inadequate intake, right? So uh, vegans are well known for not having vitamin B12 in their diet because they don't eat animals. And so um, um, a vegan needs to take a vitamin B12 supplement. Um, and then malabsorption. So remember we talked about intrinsic factor and how uh, someone who doesn't have intrinsic factor won't be able to absorb vitamin B12. Those individuals, whether they're vegan or not, are going to need to take a, a supplement. Usually it's a shot um, so that it can go around their uh, absorb or their you know, digestive system. Um, the oral symptoms for pernicious anemia are going to be angular chelosis, uh, like we can see very clearly in figure 17.3. That's like staring at me. Uh, recurrent aphthous ulcers, uh, erythematous mucosa, muco mucositis, my goodness, pale or yellowish oral mucosa, and the atrophic glossitis. Um, this one is associated with a beefy red color. Do not ask me why they needed the word beefy. I think it's kind of like the lines of the tongue resemble steak. Um, it kind of grosses me out every time I, I associate these two words. Um, but beefy red color is going to be associated, and if it happens on your boards, um, this is me telling you, beefy red color is going to be associated with pernicious anemia. So the other um, kind of association with megaloblastic or pernicious anemia is going to be folate. So B12 is the one that it's, it is deficiency in, but folate is kind of often hand in hand with a cobalamin deficiency or vitamin B12, right? Folate of course being vitamin B9. Um, so the etiology for being deficient in folate because these two work together is going to be that you don't eat enough of it, right? A poor diet, you, you get these from veggies, you don't have the animal products. And then medications that interfere with absorption, which we're gonna talk about when we get to um, these medications. Um, the oral manifestations for pernicious anemia, specifically from folate, is going to be the atrophic glossitis, ulcerations, glossodynia, angular colitis, and fungal infections. Uh, I quickly Google like pernicious anemia online and it came up with this um, because I'm not making it up. This is a common board question is pernicious anemia and it's going to be associated with that beefy red appearance. So which diagnosis below is most likely to be seen? It's B, pernicious anemia. As far as the dental hygiene considerations for pernicious anemia was going to be to encourage folate rich food sources and supplement to meet the recommended dietary allowance for folate. Large doses of folate can negate effects of anticonvulsants. So consultation with a medical provider is necessary. So people who have um, epilepsy need to talk to someone before they take uh, high doses of folate. Uh, this is kind of one of those reasons why you shouldn't give recommendations on supplementation uh, to your patients because you don't know necessarily everything about them or you may uh, kind of forget about some of these um, associations. And so be, be careful with that. Um, encourage intake of foods from animal sources high in vitamin B12 for pernicious anemia. So for vegans, you need to encourage fortified foods or supplements. Patients with permanent gastric or ileal damage need monthly intramuscular or oral vitamin B12 supplementation for life. 
Um, so if they are are somehow missing that intrinsic factor because you know they have they have like some sort of uh, absorption issue, then they're probably going to need to either take vitamin B12 uh, injection because they're missing intrinsic factor, or they're unable to absorb it or create it how how they need to. Other hematological disorders are going to include neutropenia. Uh, the etiology for this one is could be, be um, because of medications from an autoimmune disease, hematological disease like leukemia, nutritional deficiencies, and bacterial or viral infection. Um, neutropenia is a diminished number of neutrophils, which is the most abundant type of white blood cells in the blood and may predispose an immunocompromised patient to life-threatening affections. Uh, the oral manifestations of neutropenia is going to be mucositis, viral infections, and fungal infections like candidiasis. Mucositis can result in large ulcerative and necrotic lesions with extensive tissue destruction. So you want to be uh, mindful, this is this is one of those reasons why when we see an aphthous ulcer, we say, oh, that's pretty big. If it doesn't get better in two weeks, come back, right? Because if it doesn't get better in two weeks, it's not an aphthous ulcer. It's caused by something else, probably mucositis, which, I mean, could very well be caused from neutropenia, right? So uh, we, we start out small and we say, hey, this is probably what I think it is, this is the most common thing, but you know, this is how we verify is that if it, and if it's not, we need to take another step further. Um, periodontal disease can be a source of bacterial infection that can lead to a systemic infection. Okay, so if someone's struggling with neutropenia, like they're full on neutropenia, we may need to um, postpone dental treatment without a medical clearance. So here, neutropenia, dental considerations, we want to uh, postpone invasive dental treatment until the white blood cell count is back up. This happens a lot with patients who are undergoing cancer therapy. Uh, if they are really low, then we don't, we don't want to see them. We try to clean their teeth before they start chemo or radiation, um, and then by the time they need their teeth cleaned again, uh, or after they finish and their white blood cells come out, come back up, then, then they're ready to go. Palliative care, which is always uh, care to help make the patient more comfortable. That's what palliative means. It's just kind of like making the patient comfortable. Um, such as non-alcoholic chlorhexidine rinse. That's gonna be soothing rather than al alcohol being kind of abrasive on the tissue. May help reduce that bacterial load until the patient can perform a more thorough oral self-care. Um, mucositis is something that occurs, um, th like that's, you know, they, they have these huge ulcers in their mouth. It's very, very painful for them. They have a hard time eating, but they also, I mean, if you have tons of ulcers in your mouth, you're not going to brush your teeth and I don't blame you. So, um, a lot of times they'll give them rinses like chlorhexidine to kind of reduce that bacterial load until the patient is able to perform oral hygiene again. Um, stress importance of frequent oral prophylaxis and meticulous oral hygiene care once the mucositis pain subsides. So, uh, you know, we talk to our patients about it a lot, but, you know, once you start flossing regularly, guess what? The bleeding stops, things get better. Um, and so sometimes it's just a matter of being consistent in order to um, get away from those kinds of conditions. And then of course, refer to a registered dietitian because if someone is suffering from mucositis from neutropenia, they, uh, and they're having a hard time brushing their teeth, they're probably having a hard time eating nutritious food. Gastrointestinal problems uh, from a gastroesophageal reflux disease. This is like GERD, um, or we'll talk about uh, bulimia when we get there. So this is usually caused from a lower esophageal sphincter that allows gastric contents to enter the esophagus. You can see a picture of this on the top of page 334. Um, the etiology for this can be a hiatal hernia, obesity, or pregnancy. Anytime that there's kind of pressure, back pressure pushing the stomach up, um, is when we see an issue like this. And the recommendations are going to be to avoid gastroesophageal reflux disease foods. So really fatty foods um, or like really spicy foods, things like that. Uh, eat really small meals, as you can see from like that B image at the top of 334. Um, if you put food in that, it's gonna 
it's going to go down to the bottom. But if, if you filled the whole thing up, then it's going to come up the up the top and it's going to come back out. So if you eat small meals, it'll just stay in the bottom and, and be absorbed. Um, keep the patient in a semi-supine position. This is not the patient. You want to lean all the way back uh, into the Trendelenburg uh, position. So you keep them kind of sitting up a little bit and it will keep the contents of their stomach down. Um, and then assist with tobacco cessation. So someone suffering from this, uh, they really need to stay away from tobacco. Um, another recommendation that your book talks about is recommending weight loss. Um, realistically, don't recommend weight loss to them. That's uh, not your place, or at least it's not, not necessarily your place, depending on how well you know them and how comfortable you are with that patient. Uh, you know, in, in a new patient sort of setting, if you find out they have a GERD of some kind um, and they are overweight, I would probably refer them to a uh, nutritionist. So other issues, those malabsorptive issues, uh, conditions, those are going to be things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, cystic fibrosis, uh, gluten sensitivity uh, like celiac or sprue, uh, and then acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS. So it, uh, once full-blown AIDS is uh, discovered or, or you know, reached, then the, the individual has a hard time absorbing things as well. The oral manifestation of not being able to absorb your, your nutrients is going to be swollen, bleeding, erythematous gingiva, right? Lots of chronic inflammation, or not chronic, just lots of inflammation. Uh, diffuse pustular eruptions on buccal gingiva. So if they're like biting their cheek, um, then actually you can see a picture of this in figure 17.6, those oral ulcers, which are due to ulcerative colitis. Um, swelling of the lips, a cobblestone-like raised hydro, uh, hydro, <laughs> hypertrophic lesions, and then a metallic dyskesia. Different parts of the gastrointestinal tract are affected in these disorders. And so manifestations differ from one individual to another. Uh, with, even with the same condition, individuals will, will uh, present with different symptoms. So as far as uh, dental hygiene considerations, you're going to want to consult with their healthcare provider always. Um, as far as their needs for supplemental steroids and prophylactic antibiotics before the dental appointment, um, you know, because we don't want to cause anything if, if their doctor wants them to take an antibiotic in order to get their teeth cleaned, uh, if they have a, a severe malabsorptive condition. Um, encourage that patient to eat a nutrient-rich, well-balanced diet in order to enhance healing. Um, one of the things, though, is that most people, you should recommend having a lot of fiber, but someone who has a malabsorptive condition, uh, they shouldn't have a lot of fiber. They're, they're like the one uh, sort of well, one type of condition where you, you don't want to recommend high fiber foods because that increases the motility. Um, and then a healthcare provider or a registered dietitian may recommend vitamin and mineral supplementation depending on what they need. Cardiovascular conditions, um, as far as a cerebrovascular accident, which is the same as a stroke, um, cerebrovascular accidents or stroke result if occlusion or ischemia occurs in an artery supplying the brain or if hemorrhaging in the brain occurs, right? So what happens is that blood clot gets uh, like dislodged from wherever the blood clot forms, becomes an embolism, and it blocks the blood uh, as it travels towards the brain. And that's going to, you know, deprive the brain of, of uh, oxygen. And that's going to cause a stroke. So the oral manifestations for uh, a stroke is going to be um, the dysphagia, facial muscle weakness, and slurred speech. Um, so dental hygiene considerations for that cerebrovascular accident is going to be to monitor their blood pressure, always. Um, use water for rinsing or ultrasonic instrumentation. Uh, it might be contraindicated during dental care if that dysphagia is present. So that's the difficulty swallowing, right? So if they're having a really hard time swallowing, we may not want to put a ton of water in their mouth. Um, the neurological deficits may cause some to be unaware of the presence of food in the mouth. So the mouth should be checked for any pocketed food after meals. Uh, you know, you guys, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but sometimes people store things up, like tucked up into their vestibules. Um, and so, you know, um, tell them how to look for it. <laughs> um, excellent oral self-care is needed to prevent caries. Uh, patients 
may have a softer, more karyogenic diet. Um, you know, if they have a stroke and they're not able to, uh, you know, use their left side and they're only chewing on their right side because they don't have a lot of control over um, their their left side, the like the left side of their face, then they probably are choosing foods that are softer. Um, as far as those cardiovascular conditions like hypertension, um, your book talks about this, but you guys know the, the whole chart, right? Elevated stage one and stage two. Um, diuretics are frequently prescribed for patients with congenitive heart failure or for hypertension. Uh, you guys have already seen the lisinopril and the, the hydrochlorothiazide. Um, so those have negative effects on salivary flow which cause xerostomia, which cause a whole lot of, a, a whole host of other problems. Dental hygiene considerations for hypertension uh, are going to just be to minimize the stress of that appointment, uh, to monitor their blood pressure, obviously take it when they come in, um, manage medication-induced xerostomia. So we wanna give them either products or helpful hints as far as how they can mitigate some of those effects, You know, either sipping water or using a biotin or some sort of, uh, of salivary sort of um, uh, moisture, system. Uh, we want to recommend fruits and vegetables, low fat, non-fat dairy products. Uh, we want to recommend that they limit sodium, alcohol, caffeine, uh, quit smoking, exercise often, lose weight, and reduce stress. Um, these are all things that are, are great, but uh, you know, you kind of have to get to know that person before you start to recommend these kinds of things to them. Uh, cardiovascular conditions as far as hyperlipidemia, right? So this is high cholesterol. Low fat diets can result in weight loss, right? Uh, Long-term use of bile acid sequestrants may cause malabsorption of fat soluble vitamins and folic acid. So um, long-term bile acid sequestrants are things like your statin medications uh, because they will reduce the cholesterol, like the amount of cholesterol that your body absorbs. Um, but because it's reducing the amount of, of bile acid that your body makes because it wants to stop absorbing the cholesterol and that you make and the, the cholesterol that you eat. Um, so because that's how, and you'll learn it next, next term, how statin medications and how those um, anti-lipidemia uh, kind of medications work, um, because they reduce bile acid, they have that effect on bile, that's also going to affect the vitamins that bile helps us to absorb. Patients with heart disease may also be taking anticoagulants. So an anticoagulant is a blood thinner, right? So if they have heart disease, we want to reduce the chance that an embolism uh, breaks off and, and blocks the arteries leading to the heart, which would cause a, a heart attack, the same as um, you know, an embolism would uh, cause a, a, an ischemic attack, like a stroke to the brain. Dental considerations for hyperlipidemia are going to be to rec uh, recommend reducing total fat, saturated fat, and dietary cholesterol, to encourage non-karyogenic low-fat snacks, to use long, or I'm sorry, to let them know that long-term use of bile acid sequestrants um, to lower serum lipids may cause malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins and folic acid. The main thing here is that they need to be aware that taking a cholesterol medication over a long period of time can lead to vitamin deficiencies. And it's not, it's not up to you to tell them to take vitamins, right? It's up to you to let them know that there could, it could lead to a vitamin deficiency. And therefore, they need to be getting their blood work done at their doctor, okay? That's the only, the only thing you need to do as a dental hygienist. As far as the skeletal system goes, so if there's some sort of disorder in the skeletal system, um, like osteoporosis, um, a lot of times they will be treated with something, uh, with a, a medication, a biphosphonate. Now, certain biphosphonates you take orally, like it's a, it's a medication, and some biphosphonates are a, um, a an injection that you get. The injection biphosphonates are going to put you at a very high risk of osteonecrosis or the um, sort of 
death of the jawbone, um, <laughs> bone death of the jaw. Um, and so you, you want to be very mindful if an individual is taking a biphosphonate, uh, because even though it will help the overall bone density of your other bones, your mandible is kind of the opposite. So anything good for your bones is bad for your mandible, and anything really good for your mandible is bad for your bones. Um, Hyperparathyroidism um, is going to uh, play a role in your uh, osteoporosis. Oral manifestations of the skeletal system would be to an increase in size or alteration in contour of the maxilla or the mandible, an alteration in radiographic pattern, so we might start to see some of that trabeculae sort of change, the mobility of individual teeth without significant periodontal disease, pain or discomfort in jaw without obvious dental pathology, uh, an increased sensitivity of teeth without obvious dental or periodontal disease, changes in the occlusion of the teeth, abnormal sequence of deciduous tooth loss or eruption of permanent molars in young individuals. You're not going to need to, to know these specifically. I'm not going to question you on them. Hygiene considerations for the skeletal system will be to provide guidance to ensure that the patient obtains adequate calcium and vitamin D, and we want to have them avoid alcohol consumption. Um, metabolic problems um, like diabetes uh, mellitus. Um, so symptoms of type 1 diabetes is uh, going to be that fruit smelly breath and then the pre P three P's. So polydipsia, increased thirst, polyphagia, increased hunger, and polyuria, frequent urination. Or what we might also see is that unexplained weight loss. Oral manifestations in a poorly controlled diabetic patient is going to be poor healing, more severe periodontal disease, tissue necrosis from minor trauma, xerostomia, and candidiasis. The main thing as a dental hygienist that you need to be uh, talking to your patients about is that um, their diet plays a role in their control of their diabetes, and their diabetes plays a role in how well they heal overall both orally and systemically. So they need to understand there is a connection between their diabetes and how well controlled it is and what they eat and their diabetes and how well controlled it is and their overall health. So we want to encourage the frequent periodontal maintenance or meticulous oral self-care, right? This is when we, we start getting them into those stages, right? So if they have controlled diabetes, they're stage B. If they have uncontrolled diabetes, they're stage C, not stage, grade, <laughs> sorry, grade B and grade C. Um, we want to help prevent hypoglycemia by treating the patient in the morning, right, right after they eat their breakfast. Uh, we want to have access to a glucometer and a glucose source. Uh, if you don't have access to a glucometer, you just want to have a glucose source because a medical emergency of either hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, uh, because they're so similar and because, you know, obviously we're going to be worrying about hypo more so than hyper, we give them, we give them uh, the juice either way. Um, and then recognize and treat hypoglycemia quickly with the rule of 15 seconds. The rule of 15 seconds is to administer 15 grams of rapidly absorbed carbohydrate. You wait 15 minutes and you check their blood glucose with a glucometer. If the blood glucose is not in the normal range, you administer another 15 grams. So it's 15, 15, 15. Hypopituitarism. So the etiology for this is going to be congenital, they're born with it, or they got a, a pituitary tumor, so they're no longer uh, um, doing this. Um, this is going to be someone who doesn't grow. So if usually they're congenital or they have a tumor kind of early in life, and it's a kiddo who kind of grows until a certain point, and then suddenly they just stop growing. They don't gain weight. Um, they're just very small. Um, they could possibly have had a head trauma, which her harmed their pituitary gland, uh, a stroke, a radiation, or a brain infection. Um, when they have it as a child, it will decrease their growth, but it will also delay eruption of their teeth. And because they don't grow, but the teeth end up being as big as they always were supposed to, because you know teeth develop sooner than the mandible, um, 
they're, they're not going to have enough room for all of their teeth. Metabolic problems like Cushing's syndrome, so the symptoms of Cushing's syndrome are going to be that high blood pressure, prediabetes or diabetic, obesity, muscle weakness, they will bruise easily, They'll, they could have acne, uh, hirsutism is um, excessive hair growth, osteoporosis or depression. Um, yeah, I think that's really all that we need there. Oh, they, we also need to be aware um, that Cushing syndrome can lead to uh, diabetes and osteoporosis. And so if that's the case, we need to watch out for those two other conditions in our periodontal maintenance for that patient. As far as hypothyroidism goes, the etiology is going to be an inadequate consumption of iodine, an inborn error of metabolism, just the, how they are, uh, high intake of uh, goi goitrogens. Ooh. Um, goitrogens are chemicals that are present in broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, cabbage, rutabagas, turnips, uh, cauliflowers, Brussels sprouts, horseradish, and soybeans. And they actually inhibit thyroid uptake of iodine. So if you're eating, you know, one of those, uh, those all look to me to be uh, cruciferous vegetables. Um, so if you're eating a cruciferous vegetable at every single meal, then uh, you're going to be preventing your body's ability to absorb iodine, which is going to lead to hypothyroidism. Um, treatment of hyperthyroidism. Um, well, you guys learn this about in, in special needs, but hyperthyroidism, they like irradiate the thyroid and then it becomes hypothyroidism and then they treat the hypothyroidism by giving them thyroid medication. Uh, thyroid gland disorder can also cause hypothyroidism and a, uh, a deficient secretion of um, thyrotrobin, thyroid stimulating hormone. So oral manifestations for hypothyroidism in children is going to be a very short stature. They're going to have delayed eruption, severe malocclusion, right? If they don't grow, but their teeth come out normal, then they're not going to have enough room and a risk for caries more so because of their malabsorption or their, their malocclusion. Um, intellectual disabilities and macroglossia. So you can see a picture here on uh, page 339 um, for 17.10. Um, that is a picture of macroglossia where the tongue is very large and it kind of, they're kind of always open and the tongue is kind of always sticking out and it's wider than the arch of the individual, mostly because they're smaller than they should be. Uh, metabolic problems for hyperparathyroidism. So this is the hyper secretion of the parathyroid hormone and it leads to alterations in calcium, phosphorus and bone metabolism. Oral manifestations are going to be increased osteoclast bone resorption, increased bone resorption. Brown tumors occur in the head and neck, especially the mandible. You'll learn a lot more about that in oral path, uh, and they may affect the ability to consume an adequate diet. Renal disease, so this can be caused from a primary glomular disease, secondary glomular disease, <laughs> vascular disease, and that word, polycystic kidneys. Um, oral manifestations, the platelet abnormalities may cause gingival bleeding, gingival pallor, although nothing like uh, iron deficiency anemia, of course, 17, that, that other picture, man, they were very pale. Uh, bad taste from urea. So if there's like a buildup of urea in your system, uh, you're not getting rid of it, it's going to kind of be in your breath. Uh, malodor stomatitis and hairy leukoplakia. So leukoplakia, of course, being like a white patch that does not wipe off. Dental hygiene considerations for renal disease. So a medical consult needs, needs to happen because of a bleeding tendency and to determine the need for antibiotic uh, prophylaxis to prevent endocarditis and or infection of vascular access site for dialysis. So renal disease, anytime the individual has a kidney disease, um, and they're under dialysis, um, you need to be very careful with that individual, okay? Um, their fluids need to be very, uh, you know, managed. Their doctor needs to be kind of just involved in every single step along the way because kid, like kidney disease progresses very quickly um, and it's, it's one of those like day-to-day -day things that they have to manage. Um, 
you want to schedule their dental appointment for the day after dialysis. Uh, that way they don't have a buildup of that urea in their system at the time that you're cleaning their teeth. And you want to really stress to that individual meticulous oral self-care and frequent care, okay? It is absolutely essential that that person is reducing that bacterial load in their mouth in order to reduce that inflammation for themselves. Neuromuscular, uh, neuromuscular problems like Parkinson's disease. So this takes us into kind of a, a secondary section um, of the book. Um, Parkinson's disease, obviously a progressive neurological condition uh, characterized by involuntary muscle tremors. Um, Brady kinesia, which is the slowness of movement, muscle weakness, rigidity, stooped postular, decreased fine motor coordination, mask-like expression with the absence of blinking, orthostatic hypotension, and a peculiar gait. So they take rapid, short, shuffling steps with a loss of arm swing. The oral manifestations for Parkinson's disease are going to be abnormal chewing and swallowing pattern. This is going to be really difficult for this patient, especially as they kind of um, develop this. It usually like they're okay for kind of a while and then suddenly it's like completely new and, and things just get progressively worse really quickly and then they, they kind of level out again. Um, like it, it uh, progresses in spurts. Um, so oral manifestations, the, the abnormal chewing and pet swallowing pattern, that's because their muscles don't necessarily work the way that they are supposed to. Holding food in their mouth for extended periods of time. So if you are chewing something and you couldn't trust that your muscles would swallow the food, you probably would hesitate at that moment of swallowing, right? Um, these people will drool frequently, right? Because they don't have as much control over keeping their own mouth closed, um, but that's not going to prevent them from getting xerostomia. So just because they're drooling doesn't mean that they have enough saliva. Actually, they're, they're losing quite a bit of it through drooling. And then a tremor of the mandible, lips, and tongue. So it's not just in their hands, it's also in their face. Dental considerations for Parkinson's disease will be to educate that patient or their caregiver on the use of electric toothbrush if difficulty holding a conventional toothbrush. Uh, you want to get these individuals on an electric toothbrush as quickly as possible um, and as early enough in a stage of their disease as you can so that they're comfortable with it, they're, they're kind of used to it as they go. Um, and what's nice about the electronic toothbrush, at least most of them, they're thicker, like the handle is much thicker and easier to hold onto than um, the thinner toothbrush, uh, manual toothbrush. Um, so you want to let them sit upright, like when you finish treatment, um, after they've been laying down, you sit them up for, uh, it says, greater than two minutes before they stand up. So you want to kind of let them sit upright, let their you know equilibrium come back, and then they're allowed to get up and go. Don't let them stand up as soon as you sit them up. Uh, minimize the amount of water that you put into their mouth through the cavitron or through um, you know the air water syringe, um, and then don't e don't expect them to be able to close and hold the suction and kind of spit and swallow the way that you know most patients would. Try to use your suction to get the water so that they don't have to. Uh, encourage adequate protein intake and overall healthy diet to maintain weight and bone health. Um, that's just overall. You want them to be healthier in order to kind of slow the progression of their disease. Neuromuscular problems as far as developmental disabilities go. This includes cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, Down syndrome. Uh, they're all associated with abnormal oral motor development. This means that they can have a tongue retraction, tongue thrust, a tonic bite reflex, oral hypersensitivity, or a hyperactive gag reflex. All of these individuals 
Yes, they have you know, some kind of oral condition based on their systemic condition, but as you can imagine, each one of these things is going to play a role in their overall nutrition, right? If they have a tongue thrust or a tongue retraction, they're gonna have a hard time eating food, right? They suddenly spit their food out. So um, an individual like this, if they're not able to um, chew and swallow their food, then either one, they're gonna choose like a liquid kind of diet or they're gonna choose softer foods so that they don't have to chew as much. Um, or you know maybe they're not chewing as much as they should so then they swallow foods prematurely before they've been chewed up properly. And so that's gonna cause digestive issues. Or if they're, they're not able to you know, get enough calories in from their oral cavity through like regular digestion, they may end up doing a parenteral um, like a feeding tube of some kind, which as we were talking about in the chapters for vitamin deficiencies and for you know mineral deficiencies, total parenteral feeding is actually uh, not the best method for for uh, vitamins. You know, there's there's a lot of vitamin deficiencies that they can get from going that route. So um, patients like this, they you know they're going to have a connection between their uh, you know oral motor action, right, their oral health and their systemic condition, and that's all going to play a role in their nutrition. Neuromuscular problems, uh, things like epilepsy. So we talked about this a little bit in phenotoin. Uh, I'm probably saying that wrong. Epilepsy does not usually result in any specific oral or feeding problems, right? Just the seizures itself, they don't have a, this effect, um, except for, you know, possibly like um, biting down and chipping a tooth. Um, but the phenotoin that is used to treat that oral health uh, is going to cause gingival hyperplasia. I feel like you guys do cover this in special needs um, as far as having to watch out for dilantin, right? Dilantin is the medication that is a phenotoin, which you'll learn about in farm, um, but it's going to cause gingival hyperplasia, right? The other thing that dilantin does is it's going to increase your need for vitamin D, vitamin K, and folate. Basically, those that medication is going to use up your stores of it, so you need to eat more of it. And if you don't, it can affect your bone mass. Um, obviously, you're not going to recommend that the individual do anything if they're taking that medication. You're going to refer them to a nutritional counseling because you don't want to um, get them on anything or any supplement or anything like that without the approval of their doctor. Neoplasia, so nutritional requirements for persons with neoplasms is generally increased to maintain lean body mass and immune responses. Oral symptoms or signs may be secondary to malnutrition or nutrient deficiencies, like changes in taste perception. Um, the intake is reduced in those with cancer of the oral cavity, pharynx, or esophagus because odinophagia, pain on swallowing, or dysphagia. Neoplasm uh, or neoplasia, which uh, Kaposi's sarcoma. So this is associated with AIDS. Anytime you see uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, they're talking about AIDS, HIV positive patients. So this is a highly malignant tumor and it is, uh, it's in the blood vessels that occurs in the skin and oral mucosa. Uh, if it occurs in the mouth, it's going to look like a red purple macular lesion in the mouth and it can progress to raised indurated lesions with central areas of necrosis and ulceration. Uh, you'll see it. It's going to look like a uh, hematoma at first. It's kind of like a red purplish blob um, and it, it, it's going to be like lobulated like there's going to be uh, kind of like a honey not honeycomb but you know what I mean like little little beads together and then uh, it will grow. Uh, neoplasia leukemia um, so generalized malignant disease characterized by distorted proliferation and development of white blood cells. The oral manifestation for this is going to be that the gingiva becomes severely inflamed with tissue hyperplasia, areas of ulceration, necrosis, and spontaneous bleeding. Leukoplakia is a white lesion that does not wipe off. 
Um, it's going to delay wound healing, and it's going to increase susceptibility to infection. As far as cancer treatments go, there is radiation and chemotherapy, right? So the oral sort of effect from radiation is going to be a general appetite loss, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, loss of taste sensation, xerostomia, of course, because if you're irradiating the uh, salivary glands, they're very uh, sensitive, uh, difficulty in swallowing, and a burning sensation in the mouth. As far as chemotherapy effects, those will have stomatitis or mucositis. We talked about mucositis, um, but it's basically just tons of lesions inside the mouth, just red, raw, um, sore tissue with lesions. Um, oral ulcerations, I already said. Decreased absorptive capacity. Yes, in a certain sense, they, they are not, aren't absorbing things the same, but also they're, they're not really eating things the same either. Um, and then changes in their taste sensation as well. Uh, they're not going to taste things the same if they're, they're undergoing chemo. Dental hygiene considerations for cancer treatments. So um, you want to get them on an antimicrobial rinse like chlorhexidine. Uh, you want to have them taking very good care of their oral hygiene, uh, in, like give them very good oral hygiene instructions and really stress to them the importance. Uh, they'll probably be on a soft and or bland diet. You don't want to give them anything spicy or anything too like citrusy or things like that. You want them kind of on uh, pretty pretty plain food um, and you want them on kind of a higher protein intake. So as they're going through chemo or through radiation, they need to re uh, like replicate their cells more, which means they need more protein. Um, they need to avoid alcohol and hot, spicy, and acidic foods when oral lesions are present. Those are going to be painful. It's going to make a whole lot of sense to them. So, uh, they're, they're, I mean, they're going to know not to eat those kinds of foods. Um, and then you want to caution them against eating hard candy or drinking beverages containing fermentable carbohydrates to relieve the xerostomia. So, whenever you they you know if if they have xerostomia, which they probably do. Um, you don't want them either like sucking on mints or, or candies or things like that because that's going to give them cavities. And if they have xerostomia, then their, their saliva isn't buffering that, uh, that acid that the bacteria is producing. Moving to AIDS. Uh, so the symptoms for this will be a highly active antiretroviral therapy, the HAR. H-A-A-R-T, uh, classic wasting is less evident, although wasting and anorexia may be present. Opportunistic infection. I can't remember the movie it was in, but it was uh, Matthew McConaughey plays a guy who uh, he has HIV and um, he ends up getting AIDS, but he goes through this fight for like medications. Man, that was, a, that was an amazing movie. Um, multiple nutrient deficiencies and protein energy malnutrition. So we, the cause of uh, malnutrition is multifactorial and may include inadequate intake, malabsorption, and or uh, hypermetabolism. So patients receiving HART may still lose lean body mass, but because of a dramatic increase in fat cells and um, like their distributions of fats, it can be hard to diagnose. So if they're not like they're losing muscle, but they're not losing weight kind of thing. Um, the oral manifestations for uh, AIDS is going to be oral candidiasis, uh, thrush, right? Oral hairy leukoplakia. So this is going to kind of, it's leukoplakia, but like really textured. Herpetic ulcerations is kind of like one herpetic lesion heals and then you get another one and they take a really long time to heal. Uh, Kaposi sarcoma, which we talked about, um, and it, they could have severe periodontitis um, and xerostomia usually is in conjunction with any or all of those other uh, conditions. Considerations is going to be to encourage the highest possible level of oral self-care and regular preventive dental care. I mean, I don't know if it, people come in and you're like, yeah, you don't really need to clean your teeth, you know, uh, but like with people with AIDS, you're like, okay, you really need to clean your teeth. Um, to promote healing, encourage attention to adequate nutrient intake, uh, making sure they're, they're getting their, that acceptable macronutrient distribution range. Um, that's specific for them. They probably have a nutritionist giving them uh, more information as far as uh, how much protein they need to eat. 
and then use nutritional supplements or instant breakfast drinks as snacks for those needing added nutrition. Those are kind of those uh, ensure uh, higher protein um, drinks. Limit caffeine and alcohol containing beverages if xerostomia exists. And obviously we want them uh, talking to a registered dietitian. Uh, mental health problems is next. So the first one is anorexia nervosa. This is uh, typically seen in adolescent and young adult females who have an exaggerated or intense fear of becoming fat. Um, they can have zealous or self-imposed restriction, which leads to extreme weight loss. Um, so either they're not eating at all or they're eating such tiny amounts that they, they lose weight like really quickly. The criteria for a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, it needs to have that their weight loss equal to or exceeding 15% below expected or original body weight. So for someone who, you know, their BMI is anywhere between, you know, whatever is normal for, for them, um, they need to be 15% below that. Um, amenorrhea, which for a female is the loss of, of that monthly cycle. Um, excessive desire for slimness with distorted body image. A lot of times too, people with anorexia, they have a, a lot of knowledge as far as like how many calories are in things and, and uh, you know, like what foods you should be eating and they have they they're like really kind of obsessive about it um and they're usually very particular people like they you know they're very detail oriented um and they, they have a lot of like discipline in their life that's that's how they're able to have as much control over their diet um the next one is bulimia nervosa this is a eating disorder which is um not necessarily associated with significant weight loss. People don't lose a lot of weight with bulimia. Uh, they could even be slightly overweight. That's kind of the, the more um, commonly taught method or, or like condition is to be slightly overweight. Um, they go through a process of binging and purging. So um, you know, either they intentionally binge or you know, they do so unintentionally, uh, but they consume a lot of calories um, kind of in one meal or in one day, and then they purge. Um, and purging is either they throw up, which is the most common way, or sometimes they uh, exercise like um, for like hours at a time um, in order to try to get rid of more calories than they took in. Um, oral manifestations for bulimia is going to be, if they throw up, uh, erosion of the enamel, the, lingued, the lingual maxillary anterior teeth. Remember the, the pH of the stomach is kind of in the two range, uh, but we definitely, the, the critical pH for our mouth is 5.5, so our enamel is going to just uh, erode right away. Palatal bruises um, from their finger being kind of in their mouth um, as they pull their their hand out, uh, enlarged parotid glands, um, because the when you throw up like that and your saliva is trying to buffer that pH, um, then your parotid glands are the ones that are kind of working over time to try to, to help the mouth come back to homeostasis. Uh, dentin hypersensitivity, obviously if they've worn their enamel away, they're going to be pretty sensitive underneath. Um, and then paramolysis. Individuals have a strong appetite and they can binge several times a day with intakes uh, anywhere from 1,200 or more calories per episode. Um, it's also associated with compulsive stealing of food and money in order to buy food is a common characteristic. Um, and then typically the individuals choose to binge on mainly high carbohydrate, easily digestible foods. Mental health problems like mental illness, these examples are schizophrenia, depression, bipolar, and mania. Uh, mania kind of goes along with bipolar. I don't know why it's separate. Um, bipolar is, is a back and forth between depression and mania, but anyway. Uh, drugs that are frequently prescribed to treat the conditions for the mental health also have side effects that play a role on oral status. So the antipsychotic medications, anticholinergics, um, will all frequently cause xerostomia. Trazodone can have an unpleasant test, 
taste. So we talked about um, that phantom taste. Trazodone can cause that. And that one is one that is typically um, prescribed for mental illness. Dental considerations for mental illness are that they could be at an increased risk of getting cavities because they could potentially eat high carbohydrate binging uh, and low pH of saliva from vomiting, um, depending on what their condition is. Um, it, you know, I think that one's really written for bulimia. Um, they must recognize signs and symptoms of suspected eating disorders and refer patients to healthcare provider or an eating disorder facility for care. So, uh, you know, as a dental hygienist, you probably don't assume that you would be the healthcare provider to uh, to treat them for their eating disorder, uh, and you would be correct. You should refer them to a specialist uh, for eating disorders. And then caution the patient against brushing immediately after vomiting, right? So when the pH is so low when it's below that 5.5 or even below that 6.7 we do not want to then take a toothbrush in there and scrub around right because that's going to scrub away more of our tooth structure so uh, we want to have that patient swish water um, or even using a sodium bicarbonate rinse in order to neutralize that oral environment after vomiting right we want to bring that ph level back up before we brush teeth brush our teeth. Um, encourage the daily fluoride and hypersensitivity products. So, you know, when they have that exposed dentin, then uh, they, they really need extra fluoride in order to help remineralize. All right, and that is the end of chapter 17.